Hi everyone, this is Lena from Trading Edge and in this video I will show you how to use the daily time frames forecasts that I sell on the website. Uh, the reason for this video is that several of you have asked me how to use it. That's the main reason. Uh, people who have been interested to get those products. And the second reason is that uh, very often uh, when I'm on Twitter, I see comments from uh, people when they engage with me and I see that they kind of don't understand the reasoning be uh, uh, behind uh, these daily time frames predictions. They don't understand what functions these predictions serve. So the first function that they serve, they are uh, forecasts. Uh, this is an example of how my daily forecasts are. So for the month of October 2024, first of all, I have my Chinese elements. I don't always include the Chinese elements in the forecast that I sell. And the reason for this is, uh, for example, in a month like October, I expect some very big deviations from the standard. You can see the standard here is quite green. I expect uh, I'm, I'm for this, at this moment in time on the 4th of October, I'm holding a bear bias for October. So for that reason, I'm not going to include the Chinese elements uh, because some changes need to be made. And these are my bespoke changes. So I override these uh, when I feel like it. Uh, and uh, this is this overriding of the historical probabilities is not included in the product. I only sell the historical probabilities. So Depends on which my uh, month you buy. On some months, uh, I have included the Chinese time frames when I expect standard moves, uh, but on other months when I expect deviations, I don't include the Chinese time frames. So after the ti the Chinese time frames, the next uh, forecast that I have this is my historical forecast. So the historical forecast normally looks like this. One second, I'll get to it now. It has to be in the end. Ah, yes, right. So this is the October historical forecast. You, you can get this sheet if you want. If you get this sheet, you will get all the previous history. So you will see that all the time frames have been entered correctly and everything has been calculated correctly. All the probabilities have been calculated correctly. So it's up to you. You can just get this. But I recommend you, uh, if you get the other product that I just showed you a minute ago, what I do in the other product is that I copy and paste this just the probabilities because uh, at the end of the day having that history having this history is useful some for some things but uh, for a daily time frame forecast the most in, uh, the most important here is the probabilities at the end so i copy and paste these probabilities here and then i go to my excel spreadsheet for october Okay, so this is why I have pasted it. So this is the historical forecast. And then the other forecast, I have, I run a column here of gun dates. I'm counting uh, gun dates from, uh, from some important places uh, starting on the chart. And then uh, the next, that is also included in the product. And uh, for people who buy it, I can tell you exactly where the counting begins from, but it's a simple calculation. All you need is a calculator and just from looking at this, you can calculate and you know what date I started counting from. Uh, so uh, the next uh, forecast that I have is the solar eclipse back testing forecast and I have two of them actually three, but this is for my own use because these are experimental uh, ones. So if you purchase the product for 1768, uh, what am I doing? If you purchase the product for 1768, uh, it is my discretion how I decided for that particular month. If I feel that the month will have many deviations, I'm gonna include 
probably the standard forecast only if i feel that it's gonna go more to standard play i'm gonna include the second uh, type of forecast as well uh, so the first forecast is all solar eclipses included here and they're back tested on daily time frames in the previous video i showed you how i have done that so just one minute and i'll show you again Oh, one minute it's in another place suddenly ah yeah it's here now so what i have done is uh, i start these are all the days of the year and uh, i start from the solar eclipse so every single solar eclipse is on my top row and then I laid them out after that, the second one, the third one, the fourth day, number 10, 11, etc. All of them are listed vertically until the next solar eclipse. So the end of these columns are the end of the current solar eclipse. And then the next date is the beginning of the next solar eclipse. So this is from uh, 2010 and I have laid them out here. I've given them the correct color candles on their closures. And then horizontally I start counting the red and the green candles and I obtain historical probabilities. And then I collect them here and when I see several days that of the same color i highlight them here so this count here is the counting of the days after the solar eclipse so on the top row we have the solar eclipse and after that day one day two day three day four etc etc all the way until the end of this cycle and each cycle here is until the next solar eclipse so this table is made with the assumption that the lunar eclipse is not important more than a normal full moon and the reason for this um, assumption is that i'm testing the, uh, the eclipses in two different ways one uh, way is with this assumption that the lunar eclipse is just a normal lunar eclipse and the reason for this and uh, it's just a normal uh, full moon and the reason for this is that uh, on some occasions, the lunar eclipses happen before the solar eclipse. On other occasions, they happen after the solar eclipse. So for that reason, to keep things simple, I'm actually dedicating this table to the solar eclipse cycle. So I count that as the most significant event out of the two. Uh, and then I have another table where I'm making the opposite assumption that the lunar eclipse is just as important as the solar eclipse. So what I do, again, I start with the solar eclipse on the top. But then we reach a lunar eclipse. I stop the count and I start again. I write lunar eclipse and I start again. So when you see my daily time frames... Uh, in a minute again you will see three tables these are the results from table number three okay i want to monitor them that, like that for one or two years i've been monitoring them for a year now and i want to monitor them for another year and then i will decide which table produces more accurate results but uh, if you just get my uh, daily time frames uh, spreadsheet it's very unlikely that you will get this table included okay simply because it's still in an experimental stage and uh, what i do i just copy and paste this and i put them in my daily time frame cycle so for the month of october i'll copy and paste them here from here and if i choose this table as well i'll explain to you in a minute why that table is there so from here to the 31st of October, I just copy this and I paste it in the forecast that I sell to people. 
The second table is the type of eclipse. As we said previously, there are three types of solar eclipses, partial, annular, and total. Uh, the previous one, the previous cycle was a total solar eclipse on the 8th of uh, April 2024, and I back-tested only, only the total solar eclipses. So these columns here I have put in front of the total solar eclipses because it's very, it may, they make it easy then for me to count exactly the time frames that belong to that eclipse. And uh, I haven't had a chance to do it for the annular, but I'm really aiming to do this by the end of the week to have the annular uh, solar eclipses back tested in this way. Basically what I'll do, I'll find the annular ones, I'll put another column in front of them with the red color because the annular ones are showing the ring of fire around the sun. And then I'll back test them. And uh, once I finish back testing, I'll, I'll check. Uh, by then we will have a bit more information about October. So again, I'll decide whether I'll include it in October's forecast. But uh, if you purchase the uh, spreadsheet now, this is the reliable one because this has been back tested for uh, a year now and it's giving me minimum 60% accuracy. That is minimum. On some months it gave me 86% accuracy. Right. So going back to my daily time frames forecast in October. Okay, so this is what it looks like if I include that column. If you want it, I'll include it. But that doesn't mean more accuracy and I don't really like just including material for its own sake. So you have your historical forecast and you have your eclipses. So that's what you will get. This is the product that you will get. Uh, now, the reasoning behind it and the reason why I'm doing this video is uh, for you to understand how to use this uh, system and this type of forecasting. So I do not, I'm astrologer and many people assume that because I'm astrologer I will say tomorrow will happen this and the other day it will happen that. No, I do not work in that way. I use statistics and if something is not back tested very rarely uh, on a relaxing kind of night I will say will, will, will and then I'll put the caveat nothing is ever guaranteed. So every now and again I do slip in that kind of mode of making, of, uh, of using that language but uh, on a normal day, on a, on a working day I actually will not do that. If you check uh, my forecast normally they happen in the middle of the night when I kind of go in, in a more relaxed kind of language and start saying Bitcoin will go skiing and stuff like that, but there is always a caveat, no, never guaranteed, okay. My system is above all a probability system. So these forecasts, they are forecasts, they serve as forecasts. Why? Because if something has caught, if a particular date has been closing historically, on, seven, on red 78% uh, percent of the time, that is almost 79 percent of the time on red. That is a quite entrenching pattern. So the probability is higher to close on red. It's as simple as that. And again, the solar eclipses, if we have a, uh, uh, a strong probability like uh, yesterday, the 3rd of October, there was a 78 percent historical probability that it will close on a green. So yes, that is a forecast. So it does serve as a forecast. But what people then don't understand is that this, these forecasts are also forecasting tools and they have a dual purpose. There is another way you can use these forecasts. When the date does not close according to the forecast, and again, depending on how strong the percentage is, that gives us a very strong indication that the opposite trend is in operation. So for example, 57% likelihood that it will close, close on a red. That is a very small percentage. I have included them for information there. But uh, still, the probability is not really that high. 
I still use it as a forecast. I use it even 53% uh, as a forecast, but 53% I use only for the Chinese time frames because the data there is enormous that has been backtested. Here it's not that much. So I have highlighted only from 57% and above. If you see something blank here, that means that uh, uh, it's not worth the mention. Uh, no, I mean in, in these places here. It's not worth the mention. Uh, so uh, why do I use more than one forecast? Because I believe in confluences. That there is no such thing when we're using probabilities. There is no such thing as 100% guaranteed. Even if this is 100% probability, it's still not guaranteed that the next time uh, it will happen again. The more we toss a coin and the more we get heads, let's say we're lucky and we keep getting heads, 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 the more times we do this, the more we're increasing the probability of actually getting the opposite result. So on one hand, these servers forecast, on the other hand, we make a conclusion if it doesn't happen on the same day, we probably have a change of trend. And I beg your pardon, I diverged. Uh, I should have been talking about the, the concept of confluences. Okay, so the concept of confluences is that we have two lights when we are guiding ourselves on the markets. Gui uh, light number one is going back to history and uh, check the historical, get the historical probability, see what uh, the market has done in the past obtain the historical probabilities, obtain the percentages. So we've done that. It's all here in this table. And then step number two is one is not enough. Doesn't matter what pattern is there in operation. It may look very stable and very trustworthy, but it's not enough. We need the second light we have is when we're guiding ourselves on the markets is uh, the, the, the confluences. We need to confluence one forecast with another one and with another one and with another one. That's why I don't trade futures anymore. I was flicking over 30 uh, confluences as, uh, before I enter a position. And then once I enter the position, I'm again constantly flicking over 30 confluences to check what will happen. And that was uh, stealing my time. And then I would never trust myself to be entering with big sums. So I just decided that it's not worth of my time for the small amount of money that I was putting on those trades. It really wasn't worth of my time. But it is worth of my time because I changed completely how I trade. Now I trade two trades in a year maximum. Uh, and uh, unless they happen by accident in April, I opened some uh, long positions by complete accident exactly on that same day when the crash happened in April. I was visiting a friend who I haven't seen for 20 years and I had some limit orders and some of them got filled. So that was a complete accident of me entering those trades. But in terms of intentions, my intentions was only to sell Bitcoin on, I sold it on the 12th of March, just a couple of days before the top at 72,900. I've got the evidence if anyone wants to see it. And now second trade in the year that I want to make is when we hit the bottom. And, uh, but with big amount of money, with all the money that I have. So uh, that, that is how I really want to be trading from now on. And I have been doing that since uh, 2021. Uh, so, uh, uh, where was I? So for that reason, so because now I play with big amount of money, it's worth of my time. I have spent a whole year checking confluences, back testing, seeing what cycles work, seeing what cycles don't work, right? It's very difficult to navigate ourselves in the markets. And also, I do not uh, listen to what other people say. I like hearing what they say, but at the end of the day, I like to be responsible for my own decisions. So for that reason, a whole year round, I'm back testing day and night because I need to be, account I'm accountable to myself and I want to know that uh, if I make the wrong decision, I'm 100% responsible for my decision. If you want to benefit from all of that hard work, it's up to you. And also if you think you can benefit from it, 
you may have a better system than me that is giving you uh, good results. The only thing I can say is that futures trading is definitely uh, very risky and it's not worth the time. It's a game. If, if, if you want to do it instead of an electronic game, uh, that uh, it, it really does take your time and uh, uh, it stimulates you. Yeah, it's very stimulating being in a futures trade and then constantly checking confluences and keeping your ears open to any news and all of that sort of things. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, not for me. This system works best for people who want to do a very small number of trades in the year, but solidly back tested with obtained good quality probabilities that have been checked many, many times. Minimum three times I have checked all of those counts. That's minimum. And actually it's probably 12 because before every month I still double check all the counting to make sure that I don't get any percentage wrong. So these two cycles I have identified to be the most accurate cycles and for that reason these are the two cycles that I'm including. The Chinese cycle at the moment I'm still doing some testing there. I started using the Chinese cycle uh, much more recently about six months ago so that's why I put the Chinese cycle to customers uh, only on months where I'm sure that the movement will go up or down, where the move, I'm more confident of the moves. Uh, right, so is everyone clear how we reason about uh, why we have all of those uh, uh, different cycles here? And now, on a daily time frame, so I want to give you an example how it is, and, and I'll tell you what, promo what provoked me to, to do that is because, look what I posted on Twitter yesterday. I said, if today, despite the 78% historical pattern to close on green, BTC manages to close on red, take it as a signal of a bad trend in operation. Why? Why? Because it's a red candle. A lot of people understood it like that. A lot of people understood it because it's a red candle, we take it as a bear signal. And the answer is no, really. You need to read my messages correctly. And actually, I really recommend people uh, go and do a free test online about uh, to check yourself whether you can understand data, written data, verbal data, and nu numerical data. Because in my experience on Twitter, I have been a, a year now on Twitter, I'm finding that educated people who have good professions and probably are much more successful than me in life, I'm finding that they don't understand data, they don't understand the tweets, and they cannot make the right conclusions about what I'm saying. And it's quite frustrating for me because uh, I work my ass off to, uh, to deliver excellent quality work. And when, I'm, uh, when, I, when I get messages from people who are well-meaning as well, I have fallen out with several people now who are very well-meaning towards me, but because their messages were showing me that they do not understand the content of my tweets, meaning that they ju simply don't have the ability to read data and to analyze data and to make the, rank the right conclusions about data. I actually fell out with those people because they were annoying me on a regular basis, so we ended up blocking each other. And uh, I'm really inviting you, it will benefit you as a trader. Give yourself a free test online, you can find it somewhere, to check yourself. Do you understand verbal data complete, uh, correctly, written uh, text? Can you draw out the right, the right uh, conclusions from that? And then check yourself on numerical. I score 69%, by the way, and I'm really surprised. I thought I'd score much higher. But um, I scored only 69%. I did the test recently. So it's not easy. It's really not easy, particularly for... And I have, I have studied statistics because uh, my, uh, I have a degree in psychology. And on psychology, 50% of the material is statistics. So I'm not new to statistics. 
So it's not easy to understand data and to make the right conclusions, particularly for people who do not have scientific background. So I really recommend you do that test and uh, I'm also writing, uh, recording this video now for you to show you the correct reasoning about this tweet. I'm saying if despite the 78% historical pattern to close on green. So this is the key here. I didn't say if it manages to close on a red. So only because this is contrary to the 78%, only then we can make a conclusion that we are on a strong bear trend. But if here the, the prediction was the higher percentage was higher on the red and it closes on the red, no, we cannot make that prediction. We cannot make any prediction. If it, if, if it is following the historical pattern that has been obtained across 32 previous eclipses, some of them bullish, some of them bearish, that means it's just following the historical pattern of the previous eclipses. And in that way, you benefit from this forecast because it's, it's functioning well as a forecast to tell you how things will close. And on several months uh, in 2024, it, it, it performed very well, this forecast, as a forecast, because everything was aligned with these percentages. But if it doesn't extract the maximum benefit from this tool, it is also a forecasting tool. If it doesn't close on the same uh, percentage, then it, it's, it gives you an indication of what trend, trend is an operation. Then instead of being right on the daily uh, time frame, it actually gives you light, it sheds light on the actual trend that is in operation. So the correct conclusion is today closed on a green and I know that very well. Actually, guess, guess how people replied to this tweet that I found really infuriating. Somebody replied to me telling me it closed on a green as I don't fucking know. Do you think that after spending 12 hours a day researching, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know that it closed, how it closed uh, at 12 o'clock midnight UTC, I always check the closures of every single day. I'm obsessed with this. And you think you need to email, to uh, tweet to me, to tell me how, how the day has closed. And on top of that, there is no analysis there. I would understand yeah. if, you, if you say yes, but it closed on a green and therefore blah, blah, blah. No analysis. They just message saying it closed on a green. That was two messages I got. I mean, guys, seriously, and ladies, one of the messages from a woman, the other one was from a man. It doesn't matter. Seriously, I'm really asking you, stop tormenting me with low-level content. I really have zero tolerance to low-level content, and it furiates, it furiates the hell out of me. Spend some time reading the text in the tweets exactly to what it is saying and withdraw and withdraw from replying if you don't understand the meaning. Ask me a question, what actually does that mean? Or, uh, and I'm going to send you this video, that's why I'm recording this video. Either don't message anything if you don't understand or if you do understand, a reply with respect to the high quality work that I deliver, reply with the relevant high quality comment. Do your analysis. Give me your analysis. Do you think I'm full of myself and I think I'm the best thing there on the Bitcoin market? Not at all. I have several people who I follow who I have very deep respect for because every single time they provide a reasoning. They never say, Tomorrow is going to do this and it's going to do that and then leave it at that. I want to hear, to hear and to see technical reasoning. Once I see technical reasoning, it doesn't matter if you disagree with me. You can take a completely opposite position to what I think. I will show respect towards you. I will actually like, I will like your comment, even if you take a complete uh, opposite uh, bias to me. 
I will like your comment and I will engage in a very civilized conversation with you. When you present your technical reasons, not macro reasons. I don't want to know about macro reasons. The macro reason was that uh, when uh, CZ comes out of prison, the market will explode. It went down, sold on the news. So I want to know technical reasons. And if, if you happen to be really a big macro specialist and you have back tested all of those uh, macro news and actually most of them have a reverse relationship to uh, uh, the Bitcoin market, in my opinion, but I haven't back tested them. If you happen to have back tested every single bullish news on the market and then see uh, does the market actually dump or pump on that, they again get involved. But do you see here, I'm working my ass off to calculate all of those probabilities and all of these statements. I put a lot of thinking into them. I don't just blurt out the first thing that springs to mind. I'm very careful how I phrase my sentences here. And then you reply with something very clumsy, not very uh, thoughtful, lack of analysis there whatsoever. I mean, that is quite disrespectful to my work and I'm really... I'm, all of you that are writing those kind of messages are testing me to the max and uh, I have uh, different levels uh, of uh, dealing with those people. People who message me more than once or twice with rubbish like that. I just block them. Other ones, I start insulting them. But yeah, the civilized response will be really to block those people because I actually don't want to be surrounded by followers like that. I'm not a scam astrologer who says tomorrow will be a volatile day and then uh, one million people click like on their video. I've noticed those low level astrologers, they get thousands and thousands of likes because the majority of people in the world, unfortunately, are on the same level. Those same people, when they read my tweets, 100% guaranteed they don't understand what the tweet is saying. And I have got that feedback several times from people. They say, I simply do not understand what you're saying. Is it going to go up or is it going to go down? Some people simply don't understand the concept of probabilities and how we reason about this. And I'm saying to them, go to the scammer astrologers to get your forecast from there. It's not really the right place. If you want to know what will happen this is not where you're going to find that information. But if you want to know the correct way of reasoning about uh, probabilities, and if you want to obtain excellent quality probabilities, I am the right place to come to. If you want to get in, involved in a discussion which discusses reasons and confluences, Again, this is the right place to come because I list around 50% of my confluences publicly. I, I keep 50% of my confluences to myself for different reasons, not always because I want to hide them, but most of them that I keep to myself haven't been back tested. But I, I also have one or two that I have back tested and I keep to myself. Uh, again, I want to keep a bit of edge to myself. So everyone has to be very clear what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Just because I'm using astro variables, I will never make a comment about a day saying tomorrow is going to be a very volatile day. Just one sentence, boom, and that same person gets 35,000 likes. Fine, I understand. This is the age we're living. We're living in the age of noobs. Noobs like noobs. It's... It's really simple to understand why those astrologers attract the majority of viewers. I'm not upset about that in any way, but what I'm saying is that if you're the kind of person who likes a deterministic prediction about Bitcoin, just keep away from me because it just you're going to infuriate me and I'm going to have to block you anyway. If I'm on a good day, if I'm on a bad day, sometimes I get explosive. So the, the correct comment I would like to hear from people is today closed on a green, therefore, what is the conclusion, everyone? If, to, if, if yesterday closed on a green with a 78% probability that it will close on a green, what is the conclusion? 
that it is a bullish trend? I know, again, a lot of people understood it. The conclusion is that it is a bullish trend, and it's not. The conclusion is that the eclipse is moving along the historical standard pattern. This pattern has been obtained not from backtesting only the bullish or the bearish. If I had backtested only the bearish eclipses, and I'm getting this 78%, that would be different. But I backtested the 32, these are the 32 eclipses involved here. So all we can conclude here is that we are moving along the standard behavioral entrenched pattern carved by the 32 historical eclipses. But now we can get a little bit more information on historical probabilities where we have counted simply the daily closures. We had 57% closing on a red, but it didn't close on a red, it closed on a green. So this gives us additional information. So we are not that much on a standard trend then, because here we have overridden a 57% probability. So this is giving us more of a likelihood that we may have made a bull reversal because we overrode that probability there. Did we override the probability on uh, the 2nd of October? No, we didn't. If we had overridden that probability and closed on green on the 2nd of October, that would have been a much more serious conclusion about a bull reversal and a bull trend beginning because it's fighting against much higher probability. So we had here 78% red historical probability and we had here 56% uh, solar eclipse uh, have uh, solar eclipses have closed on a red so if the price action had managed to overcome these two historical patterns and still closed on a green that would have been a very strong indication that there is a lot of their bullish uh, uh, drive encoded in that green candle so these probabilities also show us here the key corners. Not every, not every day the candles are important. On some days the candles are not important. But on other days they're very important. So this day where it has two, two confluences here converging on the same conclusion, that is a cornerstone. Because both the solar eclipse and the historical forecast are giving us a red uh, expectation red historical probability. So that is a cornerstone. So that daily time frame is very that daily time frame, the day after the, the solar eclipse, the first day after the solar eclipse is a very important daily time frame and that is why I gave it a special attention on Twitter. Not every daily time frame is important. The next daily time frame, which one will be important according to you? It will be this one here. With, look, 78% historical probability of closing on green. So if that gets overcome and it closes on red, we are then making the conclusion that the trend we are on is not, is not really that bullish. It's probably, it's probably bearish. And then, uh, and why do they say probably? Because these are only two confluences. We still need to use other confluences. And that is why I said use my system only as an additional edge. This is not the ultimate edge. I've never claimed to anyone that using these two are actually sufficient in making the right decisions about the Bitcoin market. You use this as an additional edge to your already edge that you have from your own system or learning from other people. So uh, going back to that tweet yesterday, that is what I wanted to see from you guys. I really want to see some uh, intelligent people commenting on my videos. I've, I'm, 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 I'm taking this back. I'm retracing it. Let, let me just say it again. The people who commented on my video actually are intelligent and they're very skilled, and they're competent people. But why on earth didn't you fucking read this tweet here? 
before you actually wrote. You know, before you write, just think, did I actually read the tweet? I read it till, till the end. Did you read it until the end? Yeah, that is condition number one. Condition number two, did you actually understand what I said in the tweet? And condition number three, do you think that after 12 hours of research, I will want to engage with somebody with your question if it's, not a, if it's not a smart question that stimulates me? It's not about the money. I get involved with people here. I've made few friendships on Twitter with people who are giving me interesting reasoning and some of them are calling the opposite bias to me. But if you don't give me reasoning and you just reply to me that the day has closed on a green, I mean, no, you're not going to get a reply out of me. But today I will send you this video and that's all you're getting. Next time, uh, think before you actually send me a question or a comment. Telling me how the day has closed as if I, as if I don't fucking know. And without giving me there any uh, comments, uh, any analysis, any of your analysis or using my analysis and making the right conclusion. So, okay, so this is the video explaining how to use my system and what I want from people on Twitter. And uh, if you ever get blocked, you'll know why that has happened. And also, I never unfollow people first, so rest secured. Once I have followed you, I do not unfollow first. I, I block because I want to be surrounded only with smart people, smart comments. I'm building this environment here not only for other people, but for myself as well. I, I just want to be mixing with uh, smart people with who we're doing uh, interesting reasoning about the market and we're adding edge to each other. I like yesterday a friend posted about the dollar and that was a very interesting, uh, very good edge that he shared with us and I'm very uh, happy that I benefited from that edge. So again, I'm not saying I'm the best thing here on Twitter. But engage with me only in a thinking way, non-thinking way, it just infuriates me and uh, I'm going to be blocking people who are not thinking about my tweets.